first of all, I also want to just thank the Lord Jesus Amen. who ran after me and, and, and got me. And I am so, so, so happy that I know the Lord, yes. that I can serve the Lord, that I can walk through life, and I don't have to be fearful, mm -hmm. and I don't have to be afraid. Right. But I know I have many promises that he's laid out for me. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you. And I've been praying that the Lord will help me to give you this message Amen. that he has given me. And the Lord, the, the title of my message this morning is The Test. And I don't know what that conjures up in your mind when you hear those words, but in my mind, it takes me back to my school days <laughs> when the teacher walked in the classroom and said, put all your books away, yeah. we're going to have a test. Yeah. And especially if it was an unannounced test. Now, if we knew three, four days ahead that we were gonna have a test, I knew I could study and so forth. But I absolutely hated those surprise tests. Absolutely. So that's what conjures in my brain when I hear the test. Um, what was the purpose of a test? Well, in our school days, it was to see if we had understanding and knowledge of what we were being taught. It might mean that if we passed a test, we moved on to the next grade, or it might mean if we flunked, we had to stay in the same grade, or be put back a grade, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So passing a test is always good. Amen. Failing a test mm. is not so good. <laughs> so probably back in about February, I can't remember exactly, the Lord opened my eyes about the test. I read a scripture, and we're going to get to it here in a little bit, but not right away, and that just popped off the page at me. And you know, I've read that scripture hundreds of times, but the Holy Spirit was the one that popped it off the page because it was time for me to pay attention to that. And so, anyway, so the test. Do you think that God tests us? I hear people saying yes. Absolutely, yes. His word tells us that he does, and there are many examples in the Bible, and we're going to get to some of those in just a little bit. Why does God test us? Well, we've got lots of possibilities to that answer. And as I go along this morning, hopefully you will see what some of those answers are as to why God tests us. Recently, I heard, a, uh, I heard this statement, and of course, since I've got test on my brain, it really kind of stuck. But I heard this statement, there is no testimony without a test. I thought, yeah, I think I can agree with that. I know this, that when the Lord tells me or you or, or his people in the Bible, when he tells us something, I know that's a test right there. The Lord has given us something, a command, or told us to do something. And our test is we either obey him or we don't obey him. Also in the Bible, it talks about temptation. But throughout, so we're talking about a test, but we read in the Bible about temptation. And what I, what I feel like I've found concerning those two is that 
I don't really see the Lord in the Bible putting temptations on people. Satan does that. And when he does it, it's usually skewed words, half lies, half truths. For instance, in uh, the Garden of Eden, when he spoke with Eve, he spoke half truths and twisted words to her. When Jesus was in the wilderness after he had fasted for 40 days, Satan was there tempting him. He tempted him three different times. So I think we can conclude most of the time temptation will not come from the Lord. He will test you. I guarantee you he's already tested you many times in your life. Um, but he does not tempt us. Here's an interesting thing. The number 10 in the Bible means test. There are 10 commandments. Obeying those, that's what God said to do, is a test. There were 10 plagues for Egypt. That was a definite test of all that they went through with the 10 plagues. Jacob's wages from his father-in-law Laban were changed 10 different times. We wouldn't like it if our wages kept getting changed. That's a definite test. And then there were 10 virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come. Five had oil for their lamps, five didn't, but there was a test there. And there are many other of those um, as well in the Bible, but I thought, so the, the number 10 usually means, or it does mean, test in the Bible. So Tina, if you would pull up the first scripture, which is going to be Jeremiah 19, I mean, excuse me, 17, 9 to 10. And I suddenly have a drippy nose probably from getting emotional, but anyway. So, in this scripture it says, the heart, that's our heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then go on to 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And he says, I test the mind. And here, the mind means the secret parts of you. Okay, let's go on to the next scripture, which is John 6, 5 to 6. And this says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes. They were sitting out, and he was with the apostles, and, and his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And then go on. But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So there's an example of Jesus testing Philip. Let's go to the next one then, which is Psalm 26, 2 to 3. And in this, this is a psalm of David. David is writing this. And David says, test me, O Lord, and try me. Don't you know David had already been tested many times before he even said this. But he says, test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart. There we go again in the deepness of our being and my mind. And then go on. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. David welcomed the testing from the Lord because he sought after the Lord with all of his heart. Absolutely. He loved the Lord. And then let's go to the next one, which is Psalm 66.10. And this says, and this is just being written by a psalmist. This particular psalm does not specify who wrote the psalm. 
but it says, For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. So it looks like testing might be a refining for us. Okay? All right, then let's go on to the next one, which is Genesis 22, and it's 1 through 18. And I'm going to read this entire thing. So this is the scripture that I was reading back in February when it just jumped off the page. And this is concerning, of course, Abraham and Isaac, but we're going to read this. So sometime later, God tested... Okay, first of all, let me back up. So you all know the story about Abraham. Abraham walked with the Lord. The Lord brought he and his wife Sarah out of Ur of Chaldees and sent them to the promised land, but he went by way of a different route because he brought Lot and his father with him. His father died, and then they finally went into the promised land. Abraham and Sarah had no children, and um, they were praying for children and so forth. Finally, they had the great idea, which wasn't a great idea, <laughs> to give uh, Sarah's um, Hagar, and of course she had Ishmael. That was not God's plan. But anyway, but God, even sometimes when we screw up his plans, he still fixes the plan. And so Abraham and Sarah had been praying for a child. They had, God had given them a promise. They waited 25 years. They were old by the time they had that child. They had Isaac, which means promise. So we're going to start up here now. So sometime later, Isaac has been born, and he's not a baby anymore, but he's a child yet. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he says, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son. Now, he really had another son. But this was the child of the promise. Take your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. That was a couple days journey. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. I will tell you about, so move it on, thank you, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. And just leave it there for now, Tina. Okay. Put yourself in his place. I like to do that because it helps, the, for me, the scripture come alive. Here is a man who waited on a promise for 25 years, they had the child in their old age. Abraham has walked with the Lord a long time. Abraham is a, it says in the word, he is a friend of God. It doesn't say that about everybody in the Bible. But Abraham is a friend of God. He has served and followed the Lord. Yet the Lord is telling him to go sacrifice the child of the promise. I'm thinking, Lord, why are you asking him this test? 
But notice what he says here. He says to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So in spite of what's going on, he knows he's got such a trust in the Lord that even if he kills him, he's going to bring him back to life or whatever. I mean, talk about faith. Talk about faith. How many of us, that if we had a child, even if we didn't have to wait 25 years, and the Lord said to you, go sacrifice your son. Terry, go sacrifice your first son, Peter. How many of us would even consider that? Oh, wait a minute, Lord, we must have not heard you right. That's right. No way, no way. But it doesn't even show through all these scriptures, it doesn't even show that he even thought differently. He got the wood, he saddled, they saddled the donkeys, they took off. Okay, now, Tina, let's move on from there. Thank you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. He took the knife because he, you know, he was trusting the Lord. As the two of them went on together, go on, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. Innocence in his voice, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So he, he's done this rodeo before. He knows how they do a burnt sacrifice. He knows there has to be fire and wood and, and the sacrificial lamb. So he's just asking these questions. Okay? So go on, Tina. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Right there's the answer to why God was testing Abraham. God was wondering, am I still first in your life or this dear son that I've given you that you waited 25 years for? Is, is he first or am I first? If he was willing to slay that child, then the Lord knew, that was his test, the Lord knew that the Lord was still number one for Abraham. Is that all of the, those scriptures for that or do we have any more? Okay, so move on to the next one. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, 
your only son, I will surely bless you. So what's that tell us? If we pass the test, there are, there are more blessings. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. You passed the test, Abraham. You passed the test. Now, the Lord dumped this into my heart a couple of days ago about this whole scripture. So the focus here was on Abraham and his test. But do you realize there was another test going on there? Yep. The test for Isaac. Yep. It says there he was a boy. <laughs> so maybe 11, 12 years old, we don't know for sure. But notice how in the scripture, it doesn't say when his dad is tying him up and is, I mean, how many kids would let their dad tie them up and put them on an altar and he knows he's got the knife? How many kids wouldn't run away? But that boy evidently had complete trust in his father, Abraham, and his father, God. And I'd never seen that before either. So, and he's a young boy. He's not a mature man. And yet, he also passed a test that day as well. Like Abraham and Sarah, my husband and I, could not have children. And for many years, we prayed for a child. And I had been praying and fasting for many years. But I knew in my heart, I felt in my heart, that we would have children. And one morning in my quiet time with the Lord, I got a word from the Lord that I will never forget. And while it wasn't an audible voice, it was so real and so audible to me that there was absolutely no doubt. Now, I've gotten words from the Lord at times, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to check this because I'm, I'm Maybe this is me and not the Lord. But I had absolutely no doubt that day. And the word from the Lord was very short. The word was exactly, prepare and ready the room. And I knew what he meant. I knew what he meant. I knew I was supposed to set up a nursery. And you know, God... He's so good, but he also, he's up there chuckling a lot of times too. Because we had just built a new house. Sorry, I keep forgetting I have this. We had just built a new house. We'd only been in it a year or two. So I obeyed. I passed the test. I put, an, I set a whole nursery up. Like as if there was, we had a child or a child was coming. I set the whole thing up. And of course, God's up there having a good time because we had built a new house and you know, everybody that comes to the house, they want to see the house. They want a tour of the house. And you don't know how many people that toured the house and would walk into this nursery and go, oh, you're having a... No, the Lord told me we're still praying. Of course, it was a place to uh, witness It was a little over two and a half years after that that I became pregnant and we had our daughter, Hannah. But that was a test that, thank God, I passed. And I thank the Lord for, for that. Okay, uh, Tina, let's go on to the next one. 
So in Psalm 105, 17 to 20, it says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, this is Jacob's son Joseph, who was sold as a slave, and go on, they hurt his feet with fetters, he was laid in irons, until the time that his word, his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord, how did the word of the Lord test him? And then the last one, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. How did the word of the Lord test him? And let's go on to the next one, which is Psalm 37, 5 to 9. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him. And go on. Okay, Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There, there we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So again, how did the word of the Lord test Joseph? Joseph was given these specific dreams. He was a teenager. We know that he was taken into captivity when he was 17 years old. And this happened before he went into captivity. So he could have been somewhere around 15 or 16 years old when he had these dreams. First of all, he was hated by his brothers. Not necessarily because of these dreams. Because you see, and it says it in the word, that Jacob, his father, loved him more than the other boys. How many people know that when children know that there's a favorite and they're not the favorite, there's going to be bitterness and hatred towards that child. Not only did they know that, but his dad made him or had made a coat of many colors. None of the other 11 boys got that, mm. just him. Mm. So it was really his father who was causing him all this grief with his brothers. But then, of course, he tells them these dreams. The Lord God gave him those dreams. He gave him those dreams. That is, I believe, the word of the Lord. That is the word of the Lord for him. Preparing him for the test that he was going to be going through. We all know that Joseph that his brothers sold him into slavery and they took him to Egypt and he worked in Potiphar's house. And here's the deal about Joseph. You know, Joseph knew the Lord. He knew the Lord. He believed those dreams and I think I believe that he knew those were of great significance. But he walked with the Lord. Now, 
how many 17-year-old boys would you, whose brothers tried, wanted to kill him but ended up throwing him in a pit and then selling him, how many of them would still continue to walk with the Lord and do things correctly? He was in Potiphar's house. He moved up. He was, he was taking care of the whole household. He was trustworthy. He walked with the Lord. But things just kept going from bad to worse for Joseph because then Potiphar's wife uh, accused him of sexual things which he had not done, and so he was sent to prison. And, he, and, and you know what? God, I'm just mad at the world. I mean, my brothers hated me, and I got kicked. I was doing a good job at Potiphar's house, and now I hear I'm in this crappy prison, and I'm, I'm going to just be mad, and I'm going to pout, and I'm, no. This guy knew the Lord, and he just, pretty soon, he's over all the guys in prison, taking care of all of them. He's trustworthy. He never gives up. He never, never gives up. He, he I think that it was in his heart. He, he knew the Lord at some point. But that was 13 years of, of really bad life. But do we, in any of these scriptures, do we see any bitterness with Joseph? Do we see any bitterness? And so what this also is showing, I believe many times we are tested, as Joseph was tested, concerning relationships in our lives. You know, we all have family members, we have relationships with friends and coworkers, and many times things can get a little rough or edgy in some of those areas. But we see that not only did Joseph remain faithful to the Lord, just keep on doing the right thing. Keep on doing the right thing. Until one day, they needed him to come and interpret a dream for Pharaoh. And so they brought him out after 13 years. They cleaned him up, put some new clothes on him, and he went before Pharaoh. Now, 10 minutes before, he'd been in the, the dungeon, in the dirt, and, and the horrible life. But they brought him up out. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. That you, Pharaoh says, that you, Joseph, can interpret a dream to un so that we can understand it. And Joseph answered, Pharaoh, he, he answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now here's his time to shine. He's been down in this dungeon that right there speaks volumes to me. He is not going to take the credit. In front of Pharaoh, who is not a believer, he's going to witness about God. Wow. And then, then as he became ruler, he sent for his family, all of his brothers and his dad, and he took care of all of them, got them the best place in Egypt, and, and he took care of them, and he could have been spiteful to them, and he could have been hateful to them, but instead he says, no, God sent me here for such a time as this. And so he remained true with, with relationships, even when people didn't treat him right, 
even when people were hateful and spiteful and lied, his heart remained focused and standing with the Lord. Joseph passed the test. He passed many tests. His test was a test of endurance. He had to endure, 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 but still keep himself totally walking with the Lord. And you know, by all that he went through, he was now ready and able to run a country in the midst of a famine that was coming. Wow. Now, we're talking about relationships. I have a test to tell you about that I went through that, it, that I didn't pass that test for many, many years. I worked for a school district. I've worked for several school districts. Um, but there was this person who worked for the State Department. And um, I knew this person. We had gone to college together. And anyway, just to make a long story short, um, I started this new job with the school district. And anyway, this person did some very unkind things to me. And I wasn't the only person that this happened to. Um, but, and she was demanding some things of me. And so I, since I had just started the job, I mean, I found out about this the first day I walked into the job. And I knew that that was all wrong and that she was not supposed to be doing that. But I thought, okay, I'm just going to move on with this. But I had to tell my boss because I needed some information from him in order to do what she wanted me to do. And of course, when I told my boss, he knew that that was absolutely wrong. He blew up and called the State Department. Anyway, so we had worked in different jobs, this gal and I. We never actually worked together. But then when I left that job and moved to another job, the gal who I replaced, she said, I've had a lot of trouble with her. They'd even gotten into shouting matches. I'm like, I'm not going to get into a shouting match with her. I, I don't like conflict. But she did some, at, in the job I was then in, she did some very mean and ruthless things towards me. All the while, I decided I was, I was going to be nice to her. I would talk to her. I didn't like her. I didn't like her. But I didn't show that on the outside because she had been, she'd done some dirty things, not just to me, but some other people as well. And so I just continued to be nice, and when I saw her, which I didn't see her all the time, and so forth. But I knew down in here, there was a little grudge. I knew it. But you know what? I kept holding on to that. Now, I would still be nice to her if I saw her, and I would talk, but briefly, and it wasn't like I was, you know. And about... A year and a half ago, now this had been going on for years, that little bitty thing in my heart towards her. And finally, I was supposed to go to 
uh, a special event where I knew she was going to be at. And I was like, uh, <laughs> uh. But the Lord finally grabbed a hold of me. And I knew, I knew I had to let that go. And so I prayed about it. I sought the Lord. And he took it away. And when I went to that thing that we were both at, that was gone. I could truly be nice to her, not just fake nice. And, and it was gone. But I hate to say that it took me many years to pass that test. And it would have been much better if I would have jumped on that sooner. Okay, we're going to talk about who, besides me, didn't pass the test. And so if we could go to that psalm, the next one, Psalm 78, 41. So in Psalm 78, 41, it says, How often, and this is talking about the children of Israel, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And then let's... Um, Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Limited the Holy One of Israel. Okay, now let's go to the same scripture. That one was in the NIV. We're going to do the New King James for 71. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How many of you know we are not to be tempting God? And yet it happened. They limited the Holy One of Israel. So the children of Israel were told by God to go in and possess the promised land. He did, through Moses and Aaron, all kinds of miracles in which we talked about the ten plagues earlier, the test. Mighty, mighty miracles that they saw happen. And then, of course, the biggest was the splitting of the Red Sea. And they walked through on dry ground, you know. And he's telling them to possess the land. And they get to the promised land which from where they came from to the promised land, you could walk it in less than two weeks. And they got there, and they sent the 12 spies in, and we all remember that story. Ten of them came back with a bad report. Nope, giants, we can't do this. But Joshua and Caleb had a good report. We are well able. We are well able. We can do this. But everybody else is like, no, no, we can't. We're afraid. It's bad. We can't do this. So they didn't pass the test. They did not pass the test. God gave them a command. Remember, anytime God gives us a word, that's a test. And we need to pass that test. And so when you don't pass the test, guess what happens? Yeah. So they wandered another 40 years in the desert. They didn't pass the test. But here's another amazing thing that as I was studying this, that I was like, wow. They did not pass the test, but guess what God did? He still kept feeding them manna. He still kept giving them water from the rock. And he kept their clothes from wearing out. He was still a faithful God in spite of the fact that he had all this wonderful stuff for them and they didn't pass the test. And so we know what did happen is that that entire generation passed away except for Caleb and Joshua. And they then went in and possessed what God had for them, which was 
houses that were full, full of furniture and food, vineyards, fruit trees, and everything else that they needed. He had that for them two weeks later from leaving Egypt. So I wonder when we don't pass tests, what are we all missing out on that God had? In other words, they didn't get God's best. They got the second best, or maybe not even the second best. Maybe it was about the tenth best. But they didn't get God's best. When we don't pass the test, We don't get God's best. I screwed up all those years of having that little thing in my heart towards that gal. So wonder what I what I missed what I missed out on because I did that. I'll never know. Probably. Um, Anyway, a few other things. I've been pretty. I thought I was worried I wasn't, but sorry. You're you're gonna have to hear the rest of this. So, God's first test, I believe, for all of us is the salvation message. If we hear the salvation message and we receive that in our heart and believe and then we continue to live it the rest of our life, we have passed that test. Fortunately, there have been many people who didn't pass it the first, second, and third time but they did eventually, and they're still going to get a wonderful life with the Lord in heaven at some day. So, but we each make that decision. And again, through all of this, and Terry talked about this last week, so much of this is a heart issue. My deal with that woman was a heart issue. And we can't have it being a heart issue if it's gonna keep us from the Lord. Another big test that we all face deals with our money. Oh, yeah. Tithing is a test. We are told throughout Scripture that we are to tithe, to give a tenth. And actually, we are told that it's all God's, and we're really fortunate that he lets us keep 90%, and he only wants 10%. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us to tithe and give. Uh, Let's go on to the scripture, the Matthew 6, 21. Tina, thank you. So this says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Most people have misquoted this. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But that's not how it is. It's where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you have just put money in the stock market, all of a sudden you're probably checking the stock market (laughs) because that's where your treasure is, and so your heart is checking that. Or if you just bought a new boat, you're probably shining it up and keeping it nice and inside because that's part of your treasure. Why did God create giving? Why why do you think that God said we needed to give, we needed to tithe? I mean, do the angels in heaven need new outfits? No. Or... Or is he running out of gold for the streets of heaven? I don't think so. Is he running short of cattle for the cattle on a thousand hills? Why did he create giving? Good question, huh? Well, God created giving and tithing to help work the selfishness and the greed out of our lives because we were born in a fallen nature and just like you know every child has to be taught how to share how to share because it's all mine 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 well we're the same way only we're just adults doing mine 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 
We were all born selfish and greedy, some of us a little more than others. But after we are born again, that should start to change. So, what does God want from us? He wants us to develop a generous heart. He wants us to develop a grateful heart. And he wants us not to limit him. It's all about the heart. He doesn't want us to limit him. He wants us to trust and believe in him. He wants us to grow up and become like our Father God. For God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. Thank you all for listening.